How can you tell the difference between stress fractures, shin splints, and compartment syndrome? Which one do you have? How did you get it? Why can't this year end already? This video is going to focus primarily on stress fractures. If you follow me, you'd know that I haven't done parkour in almost a year because my shins are, medically speaking, 50 shades of fucked. So today, my goal is to help you guys avoid making the same mistakes that I made. My sources will be in the description of this video. First, let's get this out of the way. If you think you might have a stress fracture, answer this. Is your pain right on the shin bone itself? Is it localized in one spot smaller than five centimeters? Does it hurt when you tap on it or rub it? If you answered yes to those questions, you almost definitely have a stress fracture. Congratulations, you lost. Still not sure though? Early stage stress fractures might present weak or differing symptoms along with poorly localized pain, so let's dig deeper into this. Other common ailments that can be causing pain in your shin area are shin splints and compartment syndrome. Shin splints is a loose term that generally refers to anterior tibial stress syndrome and medial tibial stress syndrome. Anterior and medial are just fancy words that mean the outside front part and the inside front part of the shin. Although you can also get posterior shin splints which occur on the backside. The most common one, of course, is anterior. In the mildest of cases, shin splints are an inflammation of the fascia. Fascia is the connective tissue or like net that encases the muscle and connects it to the bone, the tibia. In the worst of cases, the fascia is under so much stress that it actually separates from the tibia, which, as I'm sure I don't need to tell you, is really painful. The second possibility is anterior compartment syndrome, which can be either acute or chronic. Chronic compartment syndrome happens when muscle hypertrophy outpaces fascia expansion. So the muscle grows too big too quickly for the fascia around it to stretch out and make room. Your gains are too fast. Acute compartment syndrome usually occurs after a direct hit to the muscle, causing rapid swelling of blood and fluid. This rapidly builds pressure inside the muscle and reduces circulation to it, which can result in permanent loss of feeling and muscle damage if not addressed. It sucks a whole lot. In fact, the only thing that probably sucks even more than that is a stress fracture. A stress fracture is a tiny crack in your bone itself. This kind of stress fracture is also known as the dreaded black line in the sports world. Fun. So how can you tell the difference between these injuries? Wear pain. Shin splint pain is most often felt in the attachment area of the tibialis muscle to the tibia. The pain is felt along at least a five centimeter area, and I'm not actually sure what five centimeters looks like off the cuff, I'm American. And people usually suffer from shin splints on both legs at the same time, bilaterally. Anterior compartment syndrome is primarily felt in the big tibialis muscle itself, but the pain can spread to your entire lower leg and foot. Acute compartment syndrome is gonna be felt in whichever muscle received the trauma, but chronic anterior compartment syndrome often develops in both legs, like shin splints. Stress fracture pain is felt right on the shin bone itself, and it is localized. And localized just means that you feel it in that one spot, right where the fracture is. The area of pain will be smaller than five centimeters. <sighs> Make it different each time. But you can have more than one stress fracture like I do. So you can have two or more separate painful spots on your shin bone. You also won't necessarily get stress fractures on both legs. How pain, what do they feel like? Shin splints often start out feeling like a dull ache and as they worsen, the ache and tenderness will become more pronounced. Massaging shin splints can induce that hurt in a good way kind of feeling. Anterior compartment syndrome pain can feel like a buildup of pressure as though the muscle were going to pop as well as have numbness, tingling, burning, and aching. It can also cause weakness in your movement because of an inability to properly recruit those muscle fibers and make you experience what's known as foot drop, or as I like to call it, flaccid foot. Stress fractures start out as an annoying ache, but then progress to a pronounced sharp pain in your bone that makes you wince every time you feel it. You can also develop cortical thickening over the fracture site, which means that you might have a physical hard bump protruding from your shin where the fracture is. If you've got one of these bad boys, that means that you've probably had your fracture for a while, honey. You might as well give it a name, like Donald. When pain, when do you feel it? In the early stages of shin splints, pain often appears at the beginning of an activity, disappears during the heat of the exercise, then returns again when you're cooling down. Of course, hurting more often as the shin splints progress. Compartment syndrome pain can come on really fast in the case of acute compartment syndrome or build up gradually over time as the muscle grows too fast for the fascia. When training, 
Compartment syndrome pain will progressively worsen as you exercise, then usually hurt less or stop hurting around 15 minutes after stopping. The pain is often exacerbated when you stretch the muscle by pulling your foot downwards or upwards. Similarly, with stress fractures, warming up won't make the pain go away. In fact, the opposite generally occurs. Early stage stress fractures hurt the most in the heat of the activity and oftentimes only really hurt during the impacts themselves, like when landing a jump or striking the ground. If you get decent stress fractures, you'll likely feel sharp pain right during impacts and then feel them ache for long periods of time after activity or the next day. In my experience, I could often tune out the pain after warming up, but it never actually went away. However, as the fracture progresses, it will start hurting more often. It'll begin to hurt with normal everyday activities and eventually even hurt at rest. Stress fractures also hurt to the touch, so pressing or tapping on the fracture site will make it hurt. But flexing your foot or moving your leg around won't affect the pain because it's coming from the bone and not the soft tissue. And in my experience, shin splints also ache when it's cold and when you're in airplanes for some reason, probably having to do with pressure or something. I don't know, I didn't look it up. So which one do you have? If you think you have a stress fracture, first of all, that sucks. Second of all, keep watching this video. I'm not gonna go any deeper into shin splints and compartment syndrome because other people have videos about them everywhere. Do it at Google. So stress fractures. Now I'm going to discuss the cause, diagnosis, and treatment. What causes stress fractures? You might think you know, but you almost definitely don't. Bone metabolism involves ongoing bone formation and resorption. And just so you know, resorption is a breakdown of the bone tissue into nutrients that get absorbed back into your bloodstream. So breakdown of the bone, that's what resorption is. Stress fractures occur when bone resorption outpaces bone formation. So the factors that contribute to stress fractures are those that increase bone resorption, hamper bone formation, or increase bone loading more quickly than the bone can repair. So those risk factors generally are doing an activity that involves lots of impact, of course, which increases bone resorption, inadequate nutritional intake because of caloric deficit, poor food choices, but especially in the case of eating disorders, this hampers bone formation, insufficient rest, which limits the bone's time to repair before it's loaded again, advanced untreated shin splints, and being a woman, because we just can't seem to catch a break, can we? One big risk factor is a condition known as the female athlete triad. The female athlete triad is a combination of an irregular menstrual cycle, disordered eating, and low bone density. So it's not necessarily the training intensity itself, but the lack of available energy for training that is often primarily responsible for the development of stress fractures. So you might not even be doing that much impact and develop stress fractures anyways because of an inadequate diet. To quote a Dr. Marlene DeMaio, stress fractures are most prevalent in weight-bearing, repetitive loading sports in which leanness is either emphasized, as in cheerleading or ballet, or or provide an advantage such as in long distance running. In general, female athletes are more prone to stress fractures than male athletes. In some cases, female athletes' incidence is twice that of males competing in the same sport. The factor that makes women so much more susceptible to stress fractures is hormonal. Estrogen helps maintain bone density and a drop in estrogen levels can lead to bone loss and cause women to be in an osteopenic state, which means they have a lower bone density than normal. A woman's estrogen could be low either because of stresses, like in the female athlete triad, or because they're postmenopausal. So to recap, being lean and doing an intense sport can cause women's estrogen to go down, which reduces their bone density. And lastly, advanced shin splints can expose and weaken your tibia, making you susceptible to developing stress fractures. So unchecked shin splints can lead to stress fractures, but not all stress fractures start with shin splints, like mine didn't. Now, diagnosis. The first thing you do if you think you have a stress fracture is go to an orthopedic doctor, hopefully a sports orthopedic doctor, and get an x-ray. But beware, stress fractures do not show up on x-rays early on in their development. It could take up to three months for them to become visible on x-rays. If you have more than one stress fracture like I do, you'll likely be advised to get a type of bone scan called a DEXA scan to measure your bone density and make sure that you're not in an osteopenic state. Your doctor will also ask you a series of questions about your history, and if they suspect that nutrition may have played a role in your condition, there's a good chance they'll also have you get blood work done to measure your nutrient levels. If it's 
absolutely necessary, you might be advised to get an MRI or TC99 bone scan. This is usually only reserved for cases in which the athlete will only stop training if absolutely necessary or if the athlete needs to return to training as soon as possible. So now, treatment. In a nutshell, to heal your stress fractures, immediately stop impact activity, of course. Do exercise and stick to movements that are non-weight bearing, such as stationary bike and swimming. Eat plenty of nutrient-rich food and do not be in a caloric deficit. Take a calcium and vitamin D supplement, perhaps a multivitamin, I forgot what number I was on. Maybe use an ultrasound stimulator and be really, 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 and I cannot emphasize this enough, really patient. Tibial stress fractures are delayed union fractures, which means they take a lot longer than usual to heal compared to other types of fractures. This is because the anterior tibia is an area of low vascularity, so damage there requires a lot of nutrients, energy, and time to heal. The recovery time for decent stress fractures in an adult athlete is like seven months. Your ordeal could even last up to a year or two. Yeah, it fucking sucks. And it gets worse because of course it does. Non-healing stress fractures exist, as in stress fractures that just don't heal, that just stay like that. And that's when they're called non-union fractures. And non-union fractures generally require surgical intervention. So that's the gist of it. Now I'm going to explain the recovery process further. It's likely that you'll be advised to take a multivitamin and vitamin D and calcium supplement. Regardless of your case, the risk reward factor is just on your side. Taking supplements has very little risk and it could offer you some benefit to your healing. Do not, and I repeat, do not be in a caloric deficit while recovering. Say hello to your little love handles and get used to them because being lean is the opposite of what you want to heal your bones because they require so much energy to heal. So eat sufficiently, don't skimp on the carbohydrates and make sure your diet is rich in nutrients. In addition to the nutritional component, weight gain will also recover low estrogen levels and it's been shown to yield greater benefits to the healing of stress fractures than estrogen replacement therapy. And on that topic, there isn't really any evidence that estrogen therapy such as birth control has much of an impact in repairing bone loss anyways. So just eat. And of course, cease impact but do not completely stop physical activity. Exercise promotes bone density as well as circulation, so do movements that are non-weight bearing. The absolute two best exercises you can do are stationary bike and swimming. Even if they're seated, avoid exercises that require you to push hard through your feet, like leg press. Over time, and as you can confirm the healing progress with your doctor, you'll be able to progress to standing exercises and eventually begin to increase impact. The absolute last thing you would probably resume is running. If your fractures are gnarly, like mine, your doctor might advise you to try an ultrasound bone stimulator. Low intensity pulsed ultrasound stimulators, or LIPAS for short, which sounds really weird, LIPAS, require more research to fully understand, but studies so far show very promising results. For example, two trials from 94 and 97 showed that LIPAS accelerated new fracture healing from 24% to 42%. And the benefit of lipus is even larger of groups of patients with delayed union and non-union fractures. Yeah? The overall success rate of lipus in the tibia was found to be 87%. I used it and I personally do think it made a difference. If you want to read more about exactly how the therapy works, please read the link in the description because otherwise I'd be here talking about it for a year. An ultrasound machine is another matter of risk reward. At the end of the day, if you can comfortably afford it, you might as well buy it. I bought an Exogen portable ultrasound stimulator from my doctor and placed it on my fracture site for 20 minutes twice a day for around three months. And that was not a sponsored statement unless Exogen wants it to be. Call me, I like money. So that's it, that's how you heal it. But what if your fracture doesn't heal? If you turn out to have a non-union fracture, you'll most likely need to get surgery. The surgery varies depending on each person's case, but it generally involves inserting a compression plate or rod and drilling it into the shin. <laughs> Fun. Most athletes are able to return to sports within six months of the surgery, but that procedure comes with a high rate of complications and oftentimes long lasting discomfort. If you want more details on that, please again, check out the links in the description. I wanted to make this video especially for parkour athletes because stress fractures are rare, so rare in fact that the 
Both doctors I saw wanted to do a case study on me, and one of them is actually published, which of course you can check in the description. But as rare as they are, I think they're underdiagnosed. I have a feeling there are a lot of parkour athletes out there that kind of eat like crap and might have a bump or two on their shins that they never bothered to investigate. So I really hope you learned something from this. I don't know how to end a video. The end.